Hello, friends of Herbie, and welcome to this new episode of the Campfire Talks with uh, Herbie. Uh, we have uh, uh, two guests tonight, and uh, I will immediately introduce you to Martin or Martin Nantel. Hi. Hello, Martin. How are you? Well, good. Welcome to the show. Thank we you also, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure. We also have Paula Stewart. Hello, Paula. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure. Now, we will go into the customary interview with Martin. Um, but Paula, just before we start with Martin, just two words on who are you? I'm an experienced Agile coach. I've um, been in software engineering for 25 plus years, worked with many size organizations, done lean change management, value stream assessment, and I recognized um, Tame Flow pretty quickly in terms of the potential for addressing some significant gaps that we have in the agile community. And that is understanding the constraint in a systematic way and being able to measure impacts as we move along. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Paula, I will leave you in standby uh, as I interview Martin. But after that, uh, uh, I will uh, invite you to join the conversation and, uh, and uh, interact with both of us and the, and the audience. So you'll be back soon. See you soon. See you, Paula. So uh, let's see if I can maneuver here properly like that <laughs> it's it's really like juggling here with all these windows and controls all over the place but yeah. anyway um martin who are you tell us oh my god <clears throat> well my name is uh, martin Nantel. i uh, live in canada uh, sp more specifically in quebec i'm a project manager ba business analyst uh, more recently, I'm into uh, Kanbans, and uh, that's mostly what I do at work. I'm also a coach, and uh, I coach about four teams uh, each morning, uh, four meetings, four teams, and there's two uh, two more coming up soon. Uh, I went into this, uh, I'll do a brief history of why I'm in just this uh, topic into the Kanbans and Lean and Agile and everything. Uh, my father had a company uh, when I was about 18, 20 years old and every time I was looking at the way he was working and he, he had a company, uh, a printing company, and everything he was doing um, was costing money. Uh, so I decided to look into it and, and try to understand what was going on and how we could save money. So. I've done a lot of things with Excel, with Access. I've developed a lot of uh, mini software, uh, things like that, to help my father uh, achieve uh, better goals, better profits. After uh, a few years, I went to university and I started to study in computer science. And when it's, I started to work in 1993, I discovered that, well, we were do doing some uh, programming development, but it always costs a lot of money, and most of the time we finish project with the thousand uh, anomalies that we have to correct afterwards. So when you try to uh, to sell a project to your customer, and he realizes that you have a thousand anomalies uh, that you have to correct over time. Well, it's kind of weird to say that we did our job, but we have a most we have almost a thousand anomalies to, to correct. So I started to question myself how we could do things better. So we were in 93 and I was still looking at ways of doing better things. So I discovered that by talking to uh, stakeholders directly to try to understand what they really, really wanted was the easiest way to uh, achieve our development. Uh, because we're, you were talking uh, directly to the customers, they, they had a better idea of with the, with the CME that what they wanted to do. So it was easier for us to, to, to manage it. So, so uh, did you discover Agile by your own? That's when, yeah, that's when I discovered that the Agile, what I 
discovered was a piece of paper on which the customers were writing some ideas and topics. So I just ripped out that piece of paper and started programming out of that. So that's when I discovered that understanding what your customer really, really wanted was something very important. Uh, years went by and uh, I met a guy called Daniel, not Daniel Duaro, another Daniel, and he introduced me to Agile. And uh, it was a project manager when uh, I was working on a project and this project was really going bad. So this guy came in, the other one was fired, and this guy, we called him this guy, uh, talked to us about changing the way we were, he was going to manage the project. That's why, that's when I heard the first time the, the word agile. And uh, so I went to look into the uh, internet, what agile is all about, and I discovered that, well, it's pretty team-oriented and people-oriented and stakeholder-oriented. And that's the way we finished the job. That's the way we we realized that we were able to finish the software that we had to do, finally. So after six, eight, 12 months, well, the project was finished. And that's when I discovered that. Uh, through the years, I was looking at work very differently. Uh, when I started the project, I involved more and more of the stakeholders. So I went through to see what Agile was all about. Uh, get some uh, training about that, and after that, uh, manage the project very, very differently. The people were always involved in the decisions, and most of all, prioritization. You have to prioritize what you have to do when you do a project, and this is up to the customer to do that. But I also realized that it was uh, disrupting, disruptive to bring Agile into a company that is used to you to, to manage project in a more traditional way. So I had to adapt the approach to be look like a traditional way of managing project, but with the teams really doing some Agile stuff. And that's when uh, I had most success because I was delivering projects simply. Uh, after a few years, I was still uh, looking for new ways of uh, uh, doing some uh, elicitation. Uh, I want to know more about business analysts, more about project management in general, in, in lean, in management, all those things. So I went back to university for about five years and I've met two guys, two older guys, almost 65. Uh, they were on their, their pension and they were giving some courses. So I followed one course with the two of them. There were two uh, at that uh, training. Uh, it took seven months with them, and uh, I never le left those guys until they retired. So uh, I finished my uh, my courses last year at 54. So I finished university at 54 years old. I, it's not still it's not quite finished because I like to learn new things. After that, I, I used uh, many, per um, say that approaches. Uh, learn into business analysts, as a business analyst, and in project management, and in lean, and all those days in general. So and how I did realized, you come across TeamFlow then? The, the way I came across TeamFlow, I'm going through that, is I was, every year I'm looking to uh, make some new learnings. And one day I was on LinkedIn, and I saw a post from a guy called Daniel Duaron, and uh, was talking about new ways of doing things, new, new approaches, uh, new ways of working, more productive. It's the first time I heard the word hyper, hyper productive. So I went to see who Daniel Duaron was, and he looked like a big kind of guy and uh, pretty cool. So I decided to uh, register to his two courses. So uh, the first day I met the guy, Daniel, uh, he told me, you know, when I'm finished with you in four days, you'll be getting out of here in uh, an ambulance with uh, a solute, you know, I don't know how to say that in English. And I said, wow, it's gonna, this guy's going to kill me within four days. So after two days following his course, uh, I realized that there was something there. Uh, all those questionings that I had through the years, he had the answer to that. The guy questioned just himself. So after four days, I went back home and I said, okay, we're doing Kanban software. And those are not right. I have to review that. So I spent a few hours just reviewing everything that was on the walls or in Jira now at the company. 
and to reorganize things. I have my disciples, but I don't have them all. So it's a work in progress. And as I go slowly but surely in getting people in to that, uh, some pe some new people are following because they, they see that it's working. There's something there. So everything changed when I saw that yet and thank flow. That's pretty much what uh, what I do. So first thing I do when I meet somebody, when I'm at the company uh, and somebody wants to learn how to make things better, how to work, to better work okay, and reduce delays because most of the things are delays that you have to reduce if you want to be more productive. They realize how bad they were working. Uh, when most of the team I worked with them, I could say that 50% of what they're doing are delays. This is pretty amazing. And they didn't realize that. It's like the normality for them because that's, hey, that's the way we work. That's the way the company is. So by showing that to the uh, the managers, or the directors, or the, VIP, the VPs, uh, they realize that, okay, it's not the team that is not productive. It's because the way we are doing things. But you know, change things takes a lot of courage. Change things takes time. But when people understand uh, how it could benefit them, well, they go there. They go there. They go this way. But you have to be very careful. So you're actually using Tameflow on the field. That's uh, no, really nice to hear. Uh, yeah, I'm using Tameflow on the field. But you know, I have to go very, very slowly. Uh, because when you want to change things that were done in the same way for almost 30 years, it's pretty uh, difficult. So it's one thing at a time, one step at a time, and maybe in 10 years we'll be somewhere. No, it's not true. We'll, yeah, be, we'll is, be there someday. It is a journey. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Tell us something about yourself. Now, give us the typical day of your life. Well, every day I wake up around 6, 7 o'clock. Uh, well, you want to know what I have for breakfast? I always take an uh, English muffin <laughs> with sausage in it and, uh, and some cheese and lots of coffee because I like coffee. Uh, now I work from home. Uh, I've been home for almost uh, four months now because of the uh, pandemic. I quite like it. And I could say that every day I go in different teams. I don't have to uh, change uh meeting rooms at all i just have to switch channel and i'm on with with the teams and they pretty like using a kanban board in jira it facilitates it, it the work they have to do and strangely when we are all uh in the same room doing our daily meetings uh, it takes more than 15 minutes now online takes less than 15 minutes because people have work to do people don't want to stay online too long because they want to start working right away. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, so every day, every uh, morning, I spend about three, four hours uh, doing some agile coaching. And then in the afternoon, but I have a journal that I have to do and also do some statistics and I'm trying to sell the approach to other people uh, within the company. That's and at the end of the day, work. what makes you happy oh. at the end of the day? Well, when I see that people are so happy to work that way, because it makes them, you know, Daniel used to say, Daniel Douaron uh, always tells me that, you know, we bring happiness into work. And it's true because they feel they are in control. They feel that they have, they have the information uh, to, to, uh, to tell their boss, listen, that's, that's us, that's our performance. And that's other problems that I have. So work on the problems and perform more. So they feel like it's like a relief for them. So when somebody uh, gets interested in what I'm doing and they want to learn more, that's really my uh, my feel. Uh, I feel that I had a, a, I'm making a difference there in, in, in work. Okay. So uh, you've been around for a while, but what are like the important skills or insight you have developed throughout the years? I'm not really somebody that is patient, usually. Um, I had to learn from that. I had to be patient. I had to realize, not realize, I realized that's not everybody uh, that 
are uh, at the same level first. They don't understand the things the same way that you can understand them. So you have to bring them. You have to identify those people that are quick, slower, or even uh, quicker than you. And you have to make them understand uh, what's what's in it for them. Uh, you have to, to, to try a way to communicate with them, to make yourself understand. Them. That's, that's very important. Uh, you have to be aware of how they feel about change also, because some people are scared and they're not showing it. And some people are not scared, they're willing to go through the journey to that. But the people that are not, that are not telling you that they are scared, that those are the ones that you have to watch. You have to bring them with them. You have to tell them, listen, it's not going to hurt you. You're going to learn something. And I realized that learning is not for everyone. So most of people have their comfort zone. So when you bring people out of their comfort zone, that's where they realize that they have more potential that they have. It's not dangerous to go outside your comfort zone. That's where the good everything is. And also, speaking yeah, of, be, uh, uh, speaking of comfort uh, zones and uh, going beyond, um, what are the challenges you see in this uh, in this industry? Uh, going uh, going forward, and uh, where do you see TameFlow having a role in this? Well, I think that most of the people, most of the industries are toward agile. We have to say that TameFlow is agile also. There's a lot of industries that are going are in Scrum. So everywhere you go, you're talking about a Scrum meeting. Everything is Scrum. Everything is agile and stuff. And we have to expose or show people that TameFlow, it's more than that. It's, I would say it's like project, visual project management that you have there. You have very powerful tools that you have there to control every aspect of a project in a team with, I could say, minimum effort. Because you, you just understand the information, look at the information in another way. You just have to change a little bit the way you think about project or about teams. And you'll see something different. And I think that's what we have to, to explain to people, how to look at project man management differently in order then to understand what's in it for them. And I think this is going to be uh, disruptive in the industry in the years. And you good. You need some good uh, people to uh, to apply that in companies. Of course, good so that's why we are. You need, you need good. <laughs> you need good trainers for that. <laughs> we're working exactly. You know, we're working with with uh, Daniel, and uh, he's he's always busy training, either training, uh, you no, know, delivering trainings or developing the training uh, training material. And since you mentioned this, you now let's just remind the audience that uh, if you are in need of training, you have it on the on the website tameflow.com slash tameflow dash training and there you have uh, yeah you have all the offerings there are different courses and uh, and uh, online and uh, in person of course no covid notwithstanding um so yeah you can get trained pretty well and and daniel is an exceptional trainer so uh you survived those four days did you or did you have to go to the hospital there <laughs> No, never. <laughs> no, I didn't have to go to the hospital. But I was checking myself. I was always looking where Daniel was going. Or when he was behind me, I was looking at him. I, I, I wasn't... Uh, no, I, I'm joking with that. So, uh, <clears throat> again, in, in the perspective of, of your experience, so what's, what are the rewards you've had from this industry or you would still like to get? Oh, my God. I'm not looking very for rewards. I'm just... No, I, I'm kind of a humble guy, you know. Um, well, uh, let's I think, say satisfactions. I think, yeah, I think that my satisfaction is to see people just try to do some of the things the other way. Just, just, um, just try them. Just get a feel of them. And you still don't like that. Don't go there. But just try it. Okay, one last thing here. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, you know, we have uh, our uh, uh, community site, uh, which is, is growing by the day, both in terms of 
people joining and in terms of the the actual conversations there um what what would you like to to find in this community of peers well i think the important thing is if people first read the book understand what's in the book and take the book and after that if you have questions ask your questions you'll get a response for that if we don't have the answers or if the answer's not there somebody's going to think about it and somebody like steve or daniel would be able to to uh, to explain to you don't be shy about that do it just ask questions and for the more experienced uh, people well i think that they have to contribute also when they see those kind of questions pass by and they have a response for it just go it go for it i expect a lot of an exchange there exchange of knowledge of course but also ex- exchange on experience uh, what you lived at your work how did you resolve that uh, maybe it could benefit to me if i had a situation at work and i found something well just talk about it just share it because it's going to profit to someone else also excellent and i just remind uh, those listening or watching that the the uh, community you sit down where is my finger there you have the uh, <laughs> uh, community.tameflow.com. So we're getting to the end of this interview. And, uh, and uh, as usually is the, the case, you now you have the opportunity now to, uh, to ask me a question. What would you like to know? About Tameflow? Preferably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question is asked to me. Well, uh, the question I would like to, to, to ask you, because you're a creator of that, is when you bring that to a company, how do you uh, introduce that? What, what would be the steps that you would use to, 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 to what would you use as a step? What, what, what would be the first step to introduce in TameFlow? Because I had to go through that and I have my own experience, but I would like to say to, 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 uh, to understand how you put it that in place the first time. Wow, that's not an easy question to uh, cover in, in short. So I, I probably need my, my famous uh, whiteboard. And in the meantime, maybe while I'm setting that up, you know, let's see if Paula is uh, uh, maybe willing to ask you a couple of quick questions. And I'll just set up the, the thing here. Yeah, sure. In, in the, so let's bring uh, Paula in. Uh, and Steve, is it uh, time for the publicity? Oh, wow. What is that? <laughs> this is a tame flow bottle. <laughs> no, this is alkaline water and it's called flow. The first time I saw that it was at Daniel Duaron's place. So, uh, okay. it's, so it's pretty concept. I would say. So, so that must become the official drink of tame flow practitioners, right? Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> when you do some training, you bring that and it's pretty concept. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. So let's let's bring in Paula here again, and Paula, no, maybe you have a short conversation with uh, with Martin, uh, uh, just a couple of minutes while I set up the the whiteboard here. Go Very go ahead and too. ask something. Hello, Martin. <laughs> Hello, Paula. Hey, how are you doing? Fine, yeah, thanks. So, can I ask you a question about taking? Yes, of course. Okay, so when have you and how have you? Introduce Tame Flow in the organizations that you've worked in. Well, I didn't <laughs> tell anybody. I just did it uh, because you know when you bring new ideas in the company, a huge company like I work, it's it's pretty hard to 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 put it then in place. So the first thing I did is review all the Kanban boards that we had and uh, make them a flow efficiency Kanban and tell people that, well, here are the new ways of working, not working, but using a Kanban. Just show me how you work. Well, I'll make a work feel with you. This is, will represent what you're doing. And well, that was the first steps that I did. After a while, I introduced them to the uh, full kidding uh, column. So I asked people not to start working on tasks that they know that it would create delays on it or there would be delays on, on those tasks. Um, after a while, 
uh, I wanted to uh, measure them because measurement is pretty important. So I, I had two states in each column that was waiting for an in progress. So in French is en attente and uh, en progression in French. And I said, people, okay, these are the full kidding tasks that you have. So, and nothing in there would be, would create delay on your Kanban boards. And just show me what are you working on and what are is the next task that you will be working on. That was the first steps that uh, introduced it in the company. And that's why they, that's when they realized that the Kanban was for the first time working for them. Okay. These were, so. the, these were the basic steps. So I think I'm set up here for uh, answering that uh, that question, and of course now you can comment while I'm I'm doing this. Um, so how do you introduce Tameflow? Well, le let's uh, let's say well, I have um, I have two uh, two replies here, and uh, and one is is like um, how I do it, uh, and how I do it is is in a way something that that cannot easily be taught in fact i've always been quite quite uh, um, resisting the idea of uh, of trying to teach tameflow as as a, a method a process a methodology um, because there is no cookie cutter um, so as you probably know the uh, the background of Tameflow before we got into, or I got into TOC and Kanban um, and the Agile things uh, was uh, founded on, on patterns. So patterns are, as, as you might know, uh, they, they are a, a triad of a problem in a context and a solution. And, and by observing the the presence of of such uh, such patterns all uh, uh, all over the companies uh, you start seeing uh, you start seeing them uh, everywhere so they uh, they pop up one after the other and and they start showing like the interconnections so you're building up like this network of uh, of patterns that uh, represent like your your knowledge in uh, in uh, in the things you're you're doing and what does this allow you to do well when you enter a company you try to map build a map in your mind of what are the patterns that we have here and uh, and once we we have identified what patterns might might be there uh, well we might extend the whole uh, uh, network with other patterns. So to use a TOC uh, terminology, we might be injecting a new pattern and then there is a chain reaction with other patterns that become possible because you're creating new contexts. And while you're doing this, you, uh, you always keep open uh, many, many options. Uh, but at the end, you see here what, uh, what I have created that from the original patterns for instance we might uh, we might highlight that i have been traversing this part of uh, of the of the network so that gave me the idea well maybe if i start focusing on patterns that i see over and over again uh, in in different places maybe i can uh, make this approach more systematic okay and that was uh, the uh, uh, the thought that that inspired me in uh, in uh, doing the uh, the last few chapters in the book actually the last chapters where we have these 20 odd patterns or proto patterns to be more precise uh, we're not there from the beginning. I got the suggestion from uh, none other than Dan Vacanti, who said at the end, yeah, it's a very interesting book. But then what happens? No one knows how to take this into, uh, into the common practice. So from there, the, uh, the idea of 
provide yes it's uh you know you leave them in the dark <laughs> and hope they find their way so the mental models are not sufficient they are necessary but not sufficient so i came up with this idea let's let's create a collection of some um simple proto patterns so they're not full-fledged patterns but which give you like a sort of recipe to uh, to follow and uh, the first one that you know is the story of herbie leave no one behind and we have to uh, like inculcate this story into the minds of everyone and the first person we must not leave behind guess who that is it's the ceo so we immediately address this notion that unless we have the ceo on board we're not going forward because he's he's out there alone in the woods and we can't progress unless he comes with us so that's the first oh, thing yeah. to to uh, to think about and then uh, no we want to exercise one slice of the company at the time so we're not going horizontal like uh, like agile and then scale and we're not doing big bang stuff like uh, like lean why well because we want to wire the the uh, flow of information the uh, the uh, uh, nervous system of the company so you can only start from the top and follow like one set of neurons to uh, to the bottom and improve on that before that can be extended then of course you know we must agree on this fundamental notion what is the goal it's the classical goal of goldrat make money uh, today and in the future and that has to be uh, understood why it is so important for a company uh, and i make a distinction between the goal and purpose because many people use the word goal when they really mean the purpose uh, the goal of a company is like uh, is money because it's like oxygen for the body you need it to exist and as you pretty well know if you are underwater and cannot breathe well you don't care about anything else you just must get oxygen that's the same thing uh, with money in the company and then uh, we must start to reason in terms of uh, what is it that brings value so we uh, identify this concept of the moves the minimal outcome value effort and uh, start reasoning uh, about what we can do once we know what the uh, what the value is but at the same time we start working at the operational level and there we have the metrics part so how can we measure stuff so the flow metrics and once we have the moves and the metrics well we can start to introduce buffers so we do that very early because the buffer gives us the signal that are the short circuiting of the feedback mechanism of the feedback loops to um, to the herbie of the ceo so it's very important to do the buffering as uh, as soon as possible then we can also introduce like uh, uh, other visual charts like the cumulative flow diagrams the the buffer uh, charts the fever charts and so on uh, we we go deeper into the numbers we start looking at the at the wait time the touch time the flow efficiency we reason about limiting work in process so the model why is that important that's the whole first part of the um, of the book and there we realize that okay whip limits are no good you need to do it with a dbr um, and because we're using moves we want to engage the business side and keep them accountable to make estimation of value so full kitting is not only like a sort of definition of ready as the agile folks would say but it's really an activity where the business is brought into uh, operations so we will do the forecasts automatically probabilistically and the business folks will do an estimation of value and while this is working we start to react on the signals the aging signals the buffer signals the bubble fever chart signals if you're doing uh, portfolio portfolio stuff and once you have one slice working well you don't want just one slice of the cake you want the whole cake so you extend it to the whole organization 
And when you extend it to the whole organization, you start to have multiple projects, multiple teams, multiple stakeholders, uh, multiple events. So the classical pest environment, as I call it. So that's where you need to learn to set priorities and make selections in uh, uh, across a number of uh, of projects. And there you definitely have to learn to, on the one side, do demand shaping, so deciding what to do. And then when, even if you decide you want to do something, don't commit too early. Keep the options open so you can change your mind. Um, but once you do commit, now go full, full in. And when you're going full in and you start reacting to the signals, keep your reasons logged because then at the end of the move you will do your retrospective and when you do the retrospective you will do root cause analysis so it's not like a cheerleading retrospective as we see a lot of in uh, in agile uh, but we really want to aim at root causes because there we find the common causes and in knowledge work yeah. addressing common causes is really uh, a key thing and then we evolve the DBR stuff. So it's DBR from the table level to the portfolio level. So you always ensure that your Herbie, the operational Herbie is, is active. Sorry? No, I said you have to feed Herbie. Yeah. And uh, that will bring you then to you know, like becoming a focused, a focused company because you have just one one metric which is financial throughput uh, that drives all uh, all uh, decisions um, and maybe I skipped a few things I think my my clouds actually moved around but I think you get the uh, the idea there are a few other things which are important like there I forgot to bring in uh, you no know, to uh, to get people primed so uh, so not only the story of Herbie but the story of the patient in the hospital the story of uh, the the jungle, the jeep, and uh, and the journey, and uh, of course, uh, you need to learn how to to maintain these reasons logs. Um, the whole uh, management of flowbacks is very different in Tameflow. We do we always swarm. We bring people down to the problem rather than sending problems back upstream and and you know, finishing in, in uh, infinite weight, uh, weight cues. Um, stand up for a cause, meaning don't do stand-ups for nothing. It's, they are not ceremonies. Do stand-ups when there is a reason. And when do you have a reason? When you have a signal. Or when someone discovers there is some knowledge that needs to be shared, then he raises like the stand-up flag in, uh, in, in the morning. And finally, I mean, maybe the last uh, important point is you now be accountable through throughput and in particular financial throughput not only operational throughput I think this is something that uh, I will never uh, finish to emphasize uh, we can improve operational throughput in spectacular ways with chain flow but if that does not affect the financial throughput it doesn't matter so the real throughput we, we care about is dollars over hours. So how much money you are enabling the company to bring in over any period of time. So this was like in 12 minutes, how you bootstrap a team flow into an organization. I don't know if that was, <laughs> if it answered your, your question, Marta. Yeah. Yes, pretty much, because I, I was wondering how you would introduce that to, uh, in the company, because there's a reality that uh, I, I did uh, in the company that by to be able to change things where everything's very traditional, I started with the people and I went toward up instead of going up and going down. So I started with people and I, when it was working, when it's working, when everything goes well, I show that to the manager. And after that, it goes up. Hopefully, it will go to the top. But everything that we do is oriented toward, well, say, the moves, the most important things. 
And that's what we're trying to, to demonstrate, that when we work differently, it goes upstream and try to convince, it's easier to convince afterwards. I Was think, um, yes. I'm French. sometimes I... Uh, no, we, we understood your French very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I think you you are uh, like highlighting what is the real challenge of uh, of um, introducing Tameflow because Tameflow by design uh, needs to start from the top and then go down one slice, one True. thin slice yes. in the organization. So we are aware of this and uh, I and Daniel, I mean, we are working on, on like enhanced training uh, programs and uh, um, we will have a way to uh, to package like the uh, the bootstrapping of uh, of Tameflow so that um, people that come like from an, a background like yours, which uh, uh, I mean, you you are not every day invited to to the CEO's office, so you you would get like the right kind of of arguments to uh, to open those doors and get the attention that is needed. Paula, do you have any comments? Yes. By the way, getting the CEOs um, or the C-level executives involved in the change up front makes the world a difference. Where oh, I've yeah. seen that, where I've been able to do that has been in small startups or even in medium-sized startups. Um, I, I noticed that a lot of what you're putting down is very familiar to me. Like for example, one slice at a time, I'm an X scale coach and they talk about the same thing. They call it full transformation, right? But it's a brilliant idea because if you try to take and scale out so quickly, it's incredibly difficult to find and make an impact, to measure the impact and to make the changes you need to make. You're going to be always behind the curve um measure ends and have and have a plot absolutely you've got to be able to show objective measures at the beginning and at the end place and use buffers so i'm looking at this and i'm saying oh i've experienced this with agile transformations this and this and this and this and this right and it makes complete sense to me your approach that you're taking to bootstrap I think you've got to start one slice at a time. You've got to set your goals. You know that you've reached it. <laughs> you got to show the flows, absolutely. Um, numbers, objective me metrics. You're definitely right about limiting the width. Like we've got that in the Agile community, we've got that down, right? But you're also right about the fact that it's not enough because often the constraint is between this team and that team, or it's some external, it's something exter external to multiple teams. And so many times when I've worked in agile transformations, I've seen that one thing that if we could correct it, it would make a difference to all of the teams completely. But convincing people that the leadership, that we need to focus on that, before we can do all the rest of this agile transformation has definitely been a challenge. Yeah, that's a, that's a key point of being able to start from, um, uh, from the top or uh, more aptly to actively involve the top from the very beginning, I think is uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, I've said uh, in some other campfires that unless you you have like the attention of the top, then you, you know, you, you can just as well uh, leave there and then because it, uh, yeah, uh, it will You're be really, yeah. By the way, that was, that was true when I was involved in ITIL. If you, if you guys know ITIL, right? Yeah. Years ago when we were trying to establish that framework, it was the same story. If you didn't have the executive leadership on the side of making this change, it won't work. Just forget about it. Yeah, and I think that's uh, with the focus that we have in Tameflow on uh, on throughput accounting. So being able to show uh, material impact on 
on the bottom line and uh, the, and the, 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 the money in the bank account, um, we have some arguments that uh, that uh, sea levels are definitely sensitive to much more than <laughs> like uh, you know, they story listen. story points and velocity and uh, they don't care they don't about care that. About they don't. They want to. They want to see the money. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen sea levels doing a stand-up between them any time. I well, love the idea. Just, I love, just, the just idea. Curiosity. I love the idea of so I've done plenty of retros, and I do like to focus on exper experiments and then also look at metrics and pull that in. So my retros over the years have become more action actionable, right? But I do love the focus that you make about keeping a log and then bringing that information into the retrospective to focus on the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's see. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I forgot about the people in the comments here because it was so engaging today. So let's, uh, let's see who we have here. We have Doug from Atlanta. Hi, Doug. Uh, Sri is joining us from Roaster. Rochester. Yeah, Jersey, Jersey from Poland. And we had a comment from Anna. Yes, I can confirm that Daniel Dwaron is working like crazy with team flow training. He's in sure? class yeah. right now. Oh, good. That's why he's not here. Okay, so he's, he's, uh, he's justified uh, for this evening. Okay, so Minton. Hello, Minton. Minton nice. had a amazing uh webinar about was it two weeks ago i think and uh, yeah it was there it was uh, great did a, a great great job so I, I love this that we start to see uh, other um trainers and consultants uh doing doing uh agile presentations and i know a few are also starting to write uh, sorry tame flow presentation how did i say that <laughs> Uh, and we are having a few of those also starting to write Tameflow articles. So the interest there is, is definitely uh, growing. And by the way, you know, Martin, uh, if, if you are into writing about this stuff, you know, I invite you write something and we'll uh, maybe publish it on, on the Tameflow blog. Uh, of course. So. Okay. Um, we have some more uh, 10 minutes. Uh, Paula, do you have any questions for uh, for Martin or for me? Um, let me think about it. I'm going back to the blueprint that you had. Let me maybe see if I when can bring it up. When you're talking about swarming. Sorry? When you talk about swarming. Yes. Are you meaning inside of a team or across teams? Um, okay. No, no limits, because the idea is that these uh, signals should uh, pinpoint where we have the patient in the hospital, <laughs> and then the whole organization should be helping to get that patient out. And that might mean that it might escalate even to the CO. So it's both uh, horizontal and vertical uh, swarming. So what happens though if you've got teams and the different teams are working on a specific product and they've been really focused on that and then you ask them to move and work on this other thing how do you keep them from like losing momentum because they've been working on this and they can't wait to deliver it and have customers use it but now you're refocusing them on this other priority so um if, if you have been doing the uh, uh, team flow prioritization exercise, all the things that are in flow, which by the way, even at the project uh, level, uh, so portfolio level, um, will be with a very limited whip compared to conventional portfolio management. So you have very few pr projects or products going through the value streams, so the multiple value streams. Um, if you have done the prioritization right, you will always have the most important project in front, so to say, of a less important one. 
Of course, if Mr. Murphy visits you and, uh, and you have uh, a pro growing problems um, in, uh, in, one, uh, in one project, the other one might overtake. So that might happen, yes, in terms of, of timelines for, uh, for delivery. But in any case, whenever there is an escalation, whenever something stops and uh, there is like a resource contention uh, between uh, two different projects, there is only one way to decide in Tameflow, and that is which of the two is delivering the highest financial throughput rate. The other one stops. And that's no period. That's the mental model that the whole company agrees to. It becomes like a social contract. We know that interrupting is bad. And if you do tame flow, your um, like degree of multitasking and of, of patting on the shoulder and take this, that's more important, will, will evaporate. So you will have a minimum amount of multitasking. We are very much aware of the bad consequences of multitasking and we try to avoid that as the plague. But we have Mr. Murphy, stuff happens. And when that stuff happens, we always know what is most important. We always help Herbie uh, to not get lost alone in the woods. So always one, if you have two projects, there will always be one that from a financial perspective is more important. So there are no questions and everyone should understand that and support that idea. And what I'm thinking to myself is to make that more com more um, palatable to your teams, there are certain things you could do, like ensuring they have visibility to all of that. You could make sure that they're working with certain design patterns across teams. You could make sure that they're working with certain coding standards and languages and patterns across teams so that you minimize the impact to your team members when you need to do that. Yes, I mean, there are many things that come into play here. One is, of course, like staff liquidity and T-shaped people and so on. So you want to be able to, uh, um, to have like mm, people that can be used in different, uh, in different situations but to a limit, because the whole idea of TOC is that um, you gain performance um, if, if you have highly specialized uh, folks. Why? Because uh, uh, the, the engineer that has 20 years of experience and, and knows like the code base inside out will resolve issues in a fraction of a time than the the junior yeah, hire. Yeah. Of course, you must find ways to transfer that knowledge. So knowledge transfer is part of this. But the whole idea is if someone is that skilled, naturally that person will become a bottleneck, not a herbie, not a constraint, a bottleneck. And as long as it is a bottleneck, there is no problem. But if that person becomes the constraint, then we know what to do, the five focusing steps. Yes. So as long as we can have specialized folks that bring up the performance in virtue of the very fact that they are um, masters of very deep knowledge, that's what we want to have. So rather than thinking in terms of um, uh, how do we avoid interrupting uh, folks and so on, well, if you know where your Herbie is, you also have the counterpart that anyone who is not Herbie must stand still, must stop, must wait for Herbie. So the act of subordinating to Herbie and, uh, and taking advantage of like the excess capacity. What do you do with that excess capacity? Well, if you're a junior and you're waiting, you can use it to learn, to learn the, gotcha. the uh, extended skills that may be our challenge at that point. So at the end, it, it is like a, a positive feedback loop. And I think the, the <laughs> idea of Agile, of having T-shaped people and uh, being able to, um, to, uh, to have completely cross-functional teams and, and cross-functional cross teams uh, has, has its limits uh, because then you're just not taking advantage of the, of the leverage that you have with, uh, with a constraint. 
So also, I would add, I, I, what I like to do with the, with teams is uh, usually I try I, I elaborate a matrix, an Excel matrix, in which every people show their skills. Do they master the skill? Do they know about the skill? They don't know. They want to learn, or they're masters in that. And when we have time, we try to exchange knowledge by giving them some training between peers. So in that way, uh, what we also do is uh, the the knowledge and the capacity of the team uh, will be greater through time. So it takes time to, to put that in place, but once it's on, it's in the uh, uh, say that c'est en roule, c'est en c'est en route. Okay. Um, well, teams are growing. Their knowledge are growing. They're becoming more efficient, and so they have more capacity also. Yeah, one yeah. Uh, one uh, um, like strategy or, or pattern that uh, that uh, I, I use on the ground with TeamFlow is that, of course, you want you want the folks to to pull work, so you never assign work to anyone. Um, but when uh, when uh, there is uh, when the team is gathering like in front of the ball board, sorry, and uh, and they have to like collectively decide who does what, the uh, the advice is always allow the most junior guy to pick the most challenging task that he feels uncomfortable with. That's it. Yeah. So you always get the. Uh, it's it's a bit like like a uh, Roman military thinking that you keep the veterans for last. So you try to get the juniors uh, uh, well well uh, well loaded, so to say. And of course, they will find problems and difficulties. And if they find problems and difficulties, you will have the swarming. And who will swarm with them? The veteran, the one who knows it. So it's it's the opposite. You don't don't. Uh, load up front the experienced guys but those who who need to make experience now i will say one thing i've hired i'd say subject matter experts for example a cloud architect that cloud architect had patterns and he brought those patterns to each team provided them with enough onboarding and then they were off and running so that's another way you could take somebody who's a very seasoned veteran yeah. and share his knowledge quickly and efficiently across the entire organization. Well, if you have a patterns-based approach, then that's, uh, of course, I, mean, I, I completely subscribe to that. So that's an excellent, <laughs> excellent way of doing it. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the point there is that uh, like software design patterns uh, are uh, uh, a great, great tool. And if you use it not only to code the software, but to communicate between the team members, you will have so much more clarity in communication that they will be able to, well, talk about the problem solution space in a different way. And that higher level of communication uh, in and by itself brings a lot of additional like uh, uh, team team uh, performance then of course the next thing is you now bring that same kind of experience so um, in that situation that you described Paul, I, you know i would i would like uh, 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 peak the the uh, the uh, this architect who knows about patterns saying you know what patterns are really good shall we try to apply them even to the organization not only to the code and that's your entry point to introduce tank flow Oh, that's a great idea. Because when you were talking about coming up with chain flow, that's exactly what you did. You noticed patterns between different organizations. And when you did that, you had something that was reusable. Yes, but I, I must also then be also uh, you know, clarify that the patterns that I use are Alexandrian patterns. So not quite the uh, the uh, software design patterns; those are not Alexandrian patterns, uh, but the um, the idea of Christopher Alexander. So always a problem uh, in a context, so a solution to a problem in a context, and then uh, documenting this with appropriate pattern forms, and then you have like the the uh, the pattern uh, um, like credibility level and. Uh, 
and you validate the pattern on, on the field and you see how it connects to other patterns. So you're building a pattern language that you can use both to describe uh, a situation and to design a solution for that situation. So that's I, I the think, power of that. And I'm kind of thinking about the more seasoned coaches I've met have tools from across frameworks and models. I mean, there's so many different practices in Agile, there's, right? So they have this really robust toolkit of things that they've tried in different places. And then they bring that with them and they don't take a cookie count, cutter approach. They listen, they hear what's going on in their organization and they bring up the right. I mean, that's what the experienced coaches uh, are good at, that they have the, <laughs> the experience of having been in many different places. They have seen it all, so to say, right? Um, but what Patterns brings you is a systematic, formal way to capture that experience, to be able to communicate and reason about that experience that otherwise would remain a classical example of tacit knowledge. Those coaches, they have enormous knowledge but it's not being articulated. It's at, at a certain point, it becomes like their intuition. I had that problem because I, oh my God. I, sorry. I was just saying, well, that it describes my situation in some ways. <laughs> Everybody's situation in some ways. Yeah, but I, I had that problem when, uh, uh, well, Tameflow was Tameflow, but it wasn't called Tameflow yet. Um, when uh, I, I was always very, successful on the field and at a certain point people started asking us but how do you do this i was not able to reply <laughs> so team flow was like a deliberate exercise to, to to yeah to be able to articulate now what is it i'm doing because it was like intuition gut feeling experience yeah, exactly. uh, you you knew you were totally convinced that yeah this is is going to work i know it's going to work no questions no doubts but trying to explain why it was working, impossible. Yeah, to think about it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was the stimulus that got me to start writing the very first Tameflow book in 2011, the one that I wrote with Wolfram Muller, it was published in, then in 2013. Um, and, and that was uh, uh, you know, taking the experience and uh, mixing Put it Put it up. into words. We're mixing it up with the with the patterns that I knew since uh, since uh, the early works of Copeland and bringing it up with my own patterns. So that's how the like the articulation of the experience came about. Yeah. And you know, a professional journal is a nice way to to take accounting uh, all of this also because it's day to day when you work, you realize some things, you learn new things. Uh, you have to do some research, be, maybe to understand better the things that you, you, you lived. So by maintaining your prof professional journal, that helps a lot also. So I have That's one. A good idea. Yeah, I have one. Is I think it's 70 page, 75 page. Uh, everything that I did last year is in that. Yeah. So one, yes, one, of the, one of the, uh, uh, well, one of the advanced courses that is on the, uh, on the, uh, on the drawing board is is all about pattern pattern thinking so how you apply patterns um, and and one part of that is well document your own uh, n your own knowledge base the one you have yeah. up up there in terms of patterns and, right. and that that will give you uh, um, a different dimension to uh, to how how you, how you s see yourself as well you start seeing your thoughts. You know, you said before, Marcin, that you know, this was like visual project management. Well, for me, patterns are like a, a way of visualizing the, the concepts and notions that, that you have in your head. And uh, a number of these patterns, uh, a configuration of these patterns, well, that is like a mental model, which is, yeah. which is like the, the basic <laughs> units of what we're working with in Tameflow. You know what I also like to do is, you know, mind mapping? Yes, yeah. I love mind mapping. I, I, li I like mind mapping. It's like 
very very good tool to use because when you have something you have to you have to think about you have a problem you're looking for solutions either by yourself or with your team it's a nice way to to visualize uh where you're attacking to and it's very brainstorming because it's not so structured there's a little structure yeah. but not so much right? it's represent the way you're thinking yeah just yeah. let it go, let it flow. And after that, you, you can structure that if you want, but you have the main ideas yet there, and yes, probably have a solution to their roles. Mind mapping is, is an excellent technique. I agree with that. Yeah. Steve, do you have an engineering background? Well, really? software engineering, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. So you've yes. been an architect, or you've been a developer, or you've been, right? I've, I've, I was in it in the previous millennium, so in the, in the stone age of the, <laughs> of the field. Because when, when I'm talking, when I'm hearing you, and, and Martin, you were a developer as well. Uh, sorry, and I didn't you hear you. Said, well. You were both developers, right? <laughs> Originally, probably, yes. <laughs> right? So when I hear you guys talk, I hear patterns. I... Oh. Oh, we dropped. We lost Paula. We lost Paula. Oh, she's going to go back. Let's see. But anyway, we are also uh, like uh, running uh, over time here, I see. I think we're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry we lost Paul right here at the uh, at the end, but I think we we have we have exhausted the uh, the the time here. So, we we might probably um, uh, end end it here. And uh, if Paula doesn't come back now, we'll invite her again. Later. And some, yeah. Later time. Some subsequent. I'm just waiting patiently here, but can't uh, can't see her coming back. Um, sure, but you. okay. So well, Martin, it was great having you here. Thank you for uh, for your time and your uh, uh, your interview. I'm really glad you're picking up uh, Tameflow and uh, looking it's a work forward in progress. to yes, looking forward to how it will uh, uh, work out for you. And in the in the future. And, Thank you very uh, much, Steve. Pleasure. And we didn't sure. have a lot of interaction with uh, with the audience uh, um, this evening. Uh, but no, thank you to all those who were uh, were listening here as well. So until the next campfire, have a good hike in the woods. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>